I'm talking today to Ramji Raghavan, a former non-resident banker and the founder and chairman of Agastya Foundation. Their creative campus housed in Kuppam near Bangalore sprawls over a lush green 172 acres. Their work spans 21 states across India, having impacted more than 13 million children and a quarter million school teachers in the last two decades. Agastya began as a conversation on the paucity of hands-on education in India and made its mission to spark curiosity, nurture creativity, and instill confidence in economically disadvantaged children and government school teachers by bringing innovative, hands-on science education and peer-to-peer -peer learning to government schools and villages across India. As Ramji Fur himself puts it, his mission is condensed into three words, aha and haha. Welcome, Ramji Fur, to the show today. Thank you. Arsh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, sir. You have been a successful investment banker overseas. We don't know much about that avatar, where it was, when it was. Tell us a little about your growing up, why you became a banker, and most importantly, what was that inner calling from where that banker turned into a philanthropist, a social worker, and, and the yearning for bringing about so much change, which has happened. I went to a boarding school called Rishi Valley in Andhra Pradesh, not far from Bangalore. And I was there from the age of five to 16. Now, my parents at that time were living in what was then Bihar and what's Jharkhand today. And there were no good schools close by. We were living in a British MNC company colony, a company called ICI. Mm -hmm. So my father being an old student of Rishi Valley said, he would send me and my sisters to Rishi Valley. So I would spend my school days at Rishi Valley, a beautiful valley, and then go back for my holidays to a place called Gomia, which was equally beautiful. It was in a forest area mm -hmm. where they had an explosives factory. So I was going back and forth between, if you like, Northeast India and South India in the first 11 years of my schooling. And Rishi Valley is quite an unusual place by world standard. It was founded by one of the great psycho-spiritual philosophers of the last century, J. Krishnamurti. That's right. So we were exposed to a lot of his ideas and his views, very close to nature, for instance. Uh, we would spend 10 minutes every evening, or was it 15 minutes, just observing the sunset. It was a very lovely, wholesome environment not competitive at all. So uh, Rishi Valley, and then I went to university in Delhi, which was a huge change. In the early 70s, Delhi University was going through tremendous turmoil. And I had come from a very sheltered place like Rishi Valley and thrown into a cauldron of fire in Delhi. So it was a shocking adaptation for me. But anyway, I went through that. My father was a very successful CEO. He had become by then the managing director of ICI in Calcutta. And so I wanted to follow in his footsteps, mm -hmm. right? So, and become a successful CEO. And I studied economics in Delhi and then decided I would be an accountant. I went to London to do accounting. I did a year of accounting and then I switched to uh, MBA. I went to the London Business School. And while I was going through all this, obviously the Rishi Valley, the J. Krishnamurti exposure was very fundamental to my own uh, thinking. And so I would tend to question a lot of things, okay? But uh, London Business School, again, a very competitive MBA program. I met a, an ex-IIT graduate who was there and we got talking and he introduced me to a lot of socialistic ideas. So I began to read about Che Guevara and Fidel Castro and people like that, which was very dissonant from the MBA program, which was highly capitalist. So yeah. I would attend a class on finance or a marketing strategy during the day, of course, working right through the day. But when I go out some time, I would read about the life of Che Guevara. And I began to think this was very almost romantic. Okay. And when I came out of business school, I went to the Cuban embassy in London. And this was in 1978. 
at the height of the Cold War and asked them if they could get me a job in Cuba in a sugarcane field. And the woman there looked at me like I was on drugs. And she almost got upset and said, we can't just give people jobs like that and shooed me away. So I was very disappointed. I came back to India and I had this desire to do social work. The reading about the Che Guevara and all that. And I said, let's go and start a movement in India. And uh, this gentleman, the IIT person was doing some social work in uh, Jharkhand. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would join him. And then he quit because he went through a kind of crisis there. It wasn't very pleasant. And the way he described it to me, I realized this isn't easy to do. And those days, the social sector in India was not as welcoming as it is today. It was truly pretty much totally pioneering on the ground, landing in the middle of a desert. I remember visiting Rajasthan and meeting Bunker Roy, who had quit his career and left that institution. I decided this was too much for me. I didn't have the courage to follow my conviction. And I ended up joining uh, Citibank. And uh, City, I remember my father telling me, my father had grown up in industry all his life. And he said, banking would be a much more relaxed career. So I think you should join banking. And anyway, I had an economics background. Little did I know that Citibank was another cauldron of competition and extreme intense work. So I joined City and I plunged into it. I adapted to the environment. I loved it. I loved their sort of entrepreneurial, no holds barred approach. Worked in India in, uh, as a foreign exchange trader, then ended up with Citibank in San Juan in Puerto Rico in the Caribbean, and then in New York. And then I left Citibank and uh, started a New York broker dealer with some friends. That was perhaps my first attempt at doing something entrepreneurial. Till then it was more uh, executive career oriented. I wanted to become the CEO of Citibank or any other organization. That was my goal in life. And then uh, I left the broker dealer and on a visit to India. At that time, Harsh, I was living in two states of mind. One state of mind, very competitive, must make a lot of money, must become the CEO of a company. Not really be an entrepreneur, but be the CEO of a company. The other was, why is India struggling? Wherever you went, oh, you're from India. What's the situation like there? Is there a lot of poverty? and ignorance and people not educated and all that. And it used to trouble me a lot. And I remember once when Jay Krishnamurti was passing through Delhi in 1979, my father went to meet him one evening and he came back that night and I asked him, how was the meeting? And he said, Krishnaji told me a story about a judge who was very well educated, could have become the chief justice of the Supreme Court if he had continued in his career. But at the age of 40 or in his 40s, he suddenly thought very deeply about his life and walked away from everything. He just walked away. And Krishnamurti didn't explain the rest of the story. He just leaned forward and told my father, sir, think about the courage of that man. I still remember that. I was thinking on the one hand, I have my personal professional objectives. On the other, I want to, in my own way, make a difference to India make some contribution to, to rest my mind at peace. And I thought of education. And from a young age, I was always interested in creativity because I suppose of Krishnamurti. And uh, I read a book called uh, Lost Horizon by I think James Hilton. And it was about a idyllic place in the Himalayas called Shangri-La. And I used to have this dream, like we all dream when we are young, when we're old, whatever. We all have dreams. I used to dream of Shangri-La, this mythical Himalayan kingdom. And one day it clicked in my mind, maybe it'll be nice to have a school in Shangri-La, in the Himalayan foothills that would focus on nurturing creativity. So that was a dream at the back of my mind. And I, as I began to think about how to make a difference in India, I thought maybe we should start a school like. So 
As my career was unfolding with all its ups and downs on Wall Street in New York, I would visit India frequently, three or four times a year, and have conversations with my father and the former principal of Rishi Valley about education. Why is India backward? Uh, what needs to be done to the education system? Did Rishi Valley achieve its objectives? Would Krishnamurti be happy or satisfied with the quality of graduates that came out of Rishi Valley? And we concluded perhaps not, okay? Not in terms of the transformation of the consciousness, which he was interested in. So the question was, why did that not happen? And the answer was, perhaps he didn't have enough translators, teachers who could truly absorb his philosophy and bring it to the classroom in a practical way. So we said, look, if we are going to start the school on creativity, we must also think in terms of transforming teachers because that can have a multiplier effect across the system. Now, Rishi Valley, when my father was a student there, and you can relate to this, Harsh, given your recent work on ecology, Rishi Valley was a barren piece of earth. About 40 years ago, maybe in the late, and in the 1990s or so, it was declared a national bird preserve. So Rishi Valley went through an ecological regeneration, which is written about in a number of books. So at the back of my mind, I said, whatever we do with this school, Let's also have an ecological vision. We said creativity, teacher training, ecological vision. And then I would go back to Wall Street and uh, beat up on my guys and say, we need to make more money and all the rest of it. So I was leading, if you like, emotionally and intellectually uh, a dual existence. And then I ended up in London. I was uh, consulting and then I became a director of a financial services group there and doing the usual stuff, reporting to the CEO. And then uh, it struck me that this was not my cup of tea. Many years earlier, when I was in Puerto Rico, I'd gone out for dinner with an American friend to a Chinese restaurant. It was about 9, 9.30 in the evening. And uh, we were sitting there, restaurant was packed. Our table was right near the entrance, waiting for our food. When suddenly the table was overturned and I saw my friend, Larry, dive to the floor. And it shocked me. I was stunned. What the heck's going on? And there was silence in the restaurant. And I looked, I heard some whispering. And I looked and I saw a young boy holding a gun pointed at me. And then it was going like this to everyone in the restaurant. And he collected a lot of wallets and jewelry that was being passed on from table to table. And uh, he looked at everyone and said, no mire me in Spanish, which means don't look at me. If you look at me, I will shoot these two guys first, Larry and me, because we were nearest to him. By then I was sitting on the floor and I remember thinking, whose brain is going to fall on whose lap first? Is it Larry's on mine or mine on Larry's? And I said, look, Ramji, this looks like crunch time. You better say something. And I was going to stand up and tell this guy, I'm from India. You probably don't even know where India is. Okay. Do you really want to send me to Madras to my mother in a coffin? My parents had moved to Chennai by then. I was about to do that when he suddenly turned away and vanished into the night. Now, the reason I tell this story is because at that moment, when I thought the bullet was going to hit me at the nape of my neck, the only thing or person I could think of was my mother, not my bank balance, not the presentations I was making at City to senior executives, not even my father, it was my mother. So when I thought back, I said, look, at a very important crunch time, none of all this that you think is so important mattered. So maybe that's clarifying and telling you that while you need to do all this, it's not that important. And then I had this other urge to want to go and build a school. So I said, maybe the time has come to take the leap. Now, obviously the leap was not easy. There were a lot of uh, heartache and so on, but it, it triggered me. I remember the famous Pink Floyd song, 
uh, where he says, hanging on in quiet desperation is the English way. I used to think of that when I would take the underground to the office. Everyone around me, I think, is hanging around in quiet desperation. Right. Is this what I want to spend my life to? And I said, no, I might regret it, but I need to give it a shot. And hopefully things will work out and plunged into it. So that's, if you like, the backstory. I'm not sure how much of this is out there in the open, but thank you so much for sharing it. And the sun gazing at Rishi Valley, the romance between capitalism and socialism, and then the experience at Puerto Rico, the Mr. Krishna Murthy whispering in your father's ear, look at the courage which that man had. I think these are all small pieces of the whole chain, which has probably led you to do what you are doing today. I would think so, yes. I would think so. When you talk about transformation of the consciousness, what exactly do you mean? See, I'm only telling you what I think Krishnamurti meant, which I can relate to. And I say this because I'm actually going deeply into it now. And starting three months ago, I began to read Krishnamurti after 30 years and watch videos. And suddenly I realized I had never really understood. I was quoting him, I had read a lot, but it hadn't been for about 30 years. Suddenly, like a young student, I was beginning to glimpse what he was saying. And now I'm trying to practice it because he used to say, there's no point quoting me or anyone. You have to read your own book of life. Nobody can tell you, nobody, nothing no authority. You have the means to understand the book of life of yourself. As you do that, probably, or at least that's what he said, there could be a transformation of the consciousness. See, most of us, perhaps all of us, are nothing, as he says, but a bundle of memories. It's nothing, but a, we are nothing but a bum, bundle of memories, the consciousness. So it's the memories affect what we do today consciously and unconsciously, and how we think about the future. So there's the past influencing the present and the future. The past is a series of conditionings that we go through from a young age. This is good, that's bad. Believe in this, don't believe in that person is not good. This is your community, this is their community. So we are brought up constantly to think in terms of division. Everything is a division. Okay, so I'm this, you're that. So the, that's all we are, the consciousness. So the transformation of the consciousness, the challenge is, can you live in a state of mind that is not influenced even an iota, psychologically? See, physically, the past is important. You need, to, you learned a language when you were young, yeah. You have to keep it in memory to communicate today or a skill or a technology. But in the psychological realm, what he says is, it is possible to live without memory. Mm -hmm. When you do that, there is a complete transformation in your consciousness. You then probably, the elusive go freedom and enlightenment, what say a Buddha spoke about, Many others, whether it's Ramana Maharishi or Shankara, the Indian tradition, the Rishis, yeah. probably Yamuni, that is what transformation of consciousness is. Now, what he would say is it can't be a goal that I want to transform my consciousness because you're bringing cause effect thinking, the way you think in the old ways right. to this, and you can't do that. So it's not about wanting to transform your consciousness. It is about staying with your consciousness and seeing it and understanding it. Mm -hmm. And what happens, he says, when you do that is there's no conflict. You don't need to say, I want to transform, something will happen. Now, I'm not claiming I'm even remotely close to that, absolutely not. But that is what is of great personal interest to me now, more than anything else, 
the intellectual understanding of this starts helping. Yeah, but the understanding eventually can't be intellectual. Yes. It has to be neither intellectual nor emotional in the sense, emotion uh, based on sentimentality or past memories. It has to be a very clear, rational understanding where you, it's not just the mind, but the heart comes into play. So you feel it. See, it's one thing when you're thirsty, you drink a glass of water. That is different from saying, if I'm thirsty, water will quench my thirst. The latter is an intellectual thing. The former is actually feeling. Just pitching in a little bit of Hindi over here. Ye Kabir sahab ke bahut achhe dohe aur gaane gaate hain. Aur unme se ek hai, jo shayad Kabir sahab ka nahi hai, par us vakt ke saint, Sufi saints ka hai. And he thinks that... Okay, the example is that the name of the name of the water is the water. राम के नाम को राम जाने अल्लाह के नाम को अल्लाह जाने मौला के नाम को मौला जाने जो पानी के नाम को पानी जाने ये नादानी है पानी पानी रटते रटते पानी पानी रटते रटते पानी पानी रटते रटते प्यासा ही मर जाए पानी पानी Exactly. So the word Pani is not Pani. Correct. Correct. But we get all caught up in the word Pani. Yes. Yes. We are not Pani. So there is a book comparing Kabir and Krishnamurti. Okay. But yes, there is a book. But Krishnamurti in English used to say, the word is not the thing. I read in some Osho thing uh, where he defines the word individual. And if it is actually indivisible. And, and what you just mentioned previously about we are so divided in different segments and categories so that we have lost our indivisibility, the individualization. Absolutely. Absolutely. When was it that you actually decided that you are coming back to India and you are just going to dedicate yourself to a cause? So I is- probably made that decision to come back in 1998. Okay. And we started Agastya in 1999, April 1st. But I came back for good. I used to make trips from the UK to India, three, four, five trips, uh, setting the sort of foundation for Agastya, pre-operative work, etc. But I came back for good on December 31st, 2001. Okay. With family. And, and this was a cause which was much larger than yourself, uh, much more daunting than the resources which you had with yourself. How did you overcome that it is possible you may end up putting all your resources into this and nothing may emerge? There was a chance of that happening. Yeah, I think because you can't really capture the state of mind you were in some 20 odd years ago entirely accurately now, if you hadn't maintained a diary or something, which I didn't, okay? So I have to speak from memory, but clearly having quit my job, having been used to a corporate career, calling card and all that, I suddenly found that socialization had come down to almost zero. My phone wasn't ringing. There was nothing to do. Uh, You had to start from scratch. So I had to adjust with that. The second was the whole idea of uncertainty. I was not used to uncertainty. In the sense, you get used to a paycheck, meeting people, progression. Things appear to be relatively hunky-dory, moving in the right direction. It may be an illusion, but they appear to be. So when you let go of all that, you're faced with a kind of void, literally and psychologically. And you feel suddenly uncertain. So I used to feel uncertain. Where is my life going? Where will it lead to? And so on. So that was, if you like, the negative forces psychologically. On the positive side, I felt a sense of freedom and liberation from routine. I don't like routine. And there was a freedom from that. I don't have to go to the office if I don't want to. I'm not presenting to some CEO and justifying some, something and hoping he or she will agree. 
None of that. It's now entirely in my hands to do whatever I want to do. So I would pick up the phone and call somebody, go and have a meeting, take notes, ask their views on education. And I started reading a lot of books on education, creativity, and all that. And I suddenly found I was meeting a whole new spectrum of people. In India and abroad, I would visit schools in the US, the UK, talk to university professors, come to India, visit schools, talk to teachers, scientists. And intellectually, I found all of this was really interesting. So while there was a hiatus in terms of nothing to do, I was creating. So it was keeping me busy in that sense and highly stimulating. But then I went around, I realized I have to raise money. And I knew hardly knew anyone in India from the commercial sector. My father had long since retired. So I would go and make presentations for 10,000 rupees and 20,000 rupees. It didn't matter. And if somebody gave a check for 10,000 rupees, I would be thrilled. It was more the sense of accomplishment. Are, we got something for the foundation. And obviously I was living without any salary, at least for the first six, seven years. But I had a lot of support from my father. He introduced, and the former principal of Rishi Valley, Dr. Balasundram, a former schoolmate, Mahavir joined as the managing trustee. Then I had my father introduce me to Dr. P.K. Ayenga, who had retired as the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. He got very interested in this project. He gave a lot of invaluable inputs and ideas. So I was meeting some really smart people from across India and even abroad. And they began to take an interest in this project, right? So I think this kept me and Mahavir going. Having said that, I look at some of the early emails that Mahavir and I had exchanged and they were pretty uh, tough emails where Mahavir would say, you said you want to do this training teacher. It's been two years and we had zero progress. We are going to set up, uh, raise 40 crores to set up this beautiful, guess what? We have not raised even 20 lakhs. So is this for real? And by then I had met the government of Andhra Pradesh and finally we had acquired 172 acres of land, barren wasteland near Bangalore. So that was a coup, great news. Yeah. But the, I had this Himalayan foothill dream and here I had, uh, undulating, beautiful views, but barren, rocky wasteland. And I remember my father was me, with me on the land in 2000 or something, or 99. And he said, you look very disappointed. And I said, there isn't even a single tree here. And he said, look, Ramji, what is your job? Your job is to take barren wasteland and transform it into a Himalayan foot. That's where you come in not to get ready-made served to you on a platter, a Himalayan foothill, then what is your contribution? So don't think about things as they are now. Think about how they might be. And I was standing there on the land, sweating in the heat. And suddenly I felt, ah, that is my role. It was like an epiphany. And that, that boosts your motivation and energy level. First five years were very difficult. I had no option. There's this famous thing about the, the guy from Morocco when he went to conquer Spain. He, he looked at his troops and said, burn all the ships because we're not going back. And we mustn't even think we have the option of going. So I felt I had, quote, burnt my boats. There was no question of going back because in financial services, uh, if you're out for six months, nine months, 12 months, forget about a year or two or three, you're really obsolescent. And it was a different country and I'd come back here. So there, there was no question of going back. There was no question of joining a company, an MNC and all that in India. And hey, when you have no option, you just go full blast. And how did the name Agastya come about? Agastya, I think uh, 1998, I was with a friend of mine in London and we were having a pizza, a very spiritual individual, a great poet as well, Gopi warrior. 
And uh, I said, I want a name. And he said, what kind of name? And I said, a name that's an Indian name that's not too long. And he closed his eyes and then he said, Agastya. I said, okay, I'll use that. He said, good. And then uh, I asked him, was that the name of a Rishi? He said, uh, yes. And I said, can you tell me something about him? He said, don't worry about all that. Just go with the name. But remember something he said, Agastya stands for no ego. You asked me for a name, I did not impose it on you. You asked me and I gave you the name, which means whether the foundation fails or succeeds, don't think it's because of you. Just do your work. Never imagine that you were the cause of, you are only the delivery system. I said, okay. So I have to constantly remind myself of that. So that's the background to the name. And if that what gives you all the equanimity? I don't know if I have the equanimity, but I'll tell you something. There is a lovely Augustia statue on my campus. And uh, whenever I visit the campus, I go and spend a few minutes paying my respects to the Rishi. And the wind is blowing. You've been there. It's beautiful, lovely place. And it's really peaceful. And uh, I seek his blessings. That's about it. And I suppose that makes a big difference. And no, I have been to the campus. I look forward to being there soon again, but have had wonderful experiences. I think at your campus, the environmental pleasure one has, and at the same time, the social inclusion, which uh, we are able to witness, to see, and the governance standards which you have set up in Agastya, in your offices, between your people, on your website, in terms of numbers and financials. I think uh, you are a complete example of the most uh, talked about term in corporate India today, ESG. Right. No, thank you. It's very good to hear that from you. Uh, what, what have been some of the most audacious challenges you have faced since you came up thinking about this idea of Agastya and bringing it where it is? So one was the original idea was to build a school for creativity. But since we didn't have money in the beginning hmm. to actually build a school, it, it came in trickles. We ended up creating a resource center, a school for schools. And so we were forced into that and that was a big change in our thinking. The other thing was when we got the land, which was a big coup, it should have been obvious to me as a former banker, okay, you need money to build the buildings and bring the equipment, but the money wasn't coming. The idea was too new or foreign or different to a lot of people. And I didn't know many people. So we did what we were very good at and still are good, very good at. We huddled and brainstormed. Mahavir, my father and I on a road trip to Coimbatore. Mahavir says we came up with the idea of a mobile lab. So we said, since we don't have money to build buildings, we need to do something. Let's get a van, stuff it with science experiments and send it around the villages. So a friend at Hindustan Motors loaned us a vehicle. Homi Baba Center in Mumbai gave us a trunk load of small trunk of hands-on science experiments. And we trained our tractor driver to be the first science teacher. So I think those were all fairly audacious decisions that might have been taken in the heat of uh, desperation. But nevertheless, we took that. That became a super hit. And then we said, hey, this is really interesting. We never thought about this. Maybe we should scale it up. And uh, then I was fortunate to meet Chunjun, the stock market investor. And right from the you know, first meeting, he latched on to the idea of a mobile lab and said, I can see these labs all over India someday, but I'm not into charity in a big way. I will fund one mobile lab. And then that became three mobile labs. This is in 2003. Mm -hmm. He is into charity in a very big way now. Mm -hmm. And then one day he said, Look, 
this kind of piecemeal adding will not achieve your vision. So come up with a 10 year plan. So we came up with a 10 year plan. We needed 90 crores to reach 6 million children over 10 years. And he then said, I'll tell you what, I will uh, underwrite 50 crores over 10 years. That gave us a big boost. And then the government of Karnataka, meanwhile, had read about the mobile lab. They said, can you scale it across the state? And we said, yes, uh, but we need you to pay the operating costs. And they said, all right, we'll pay the operating costs, but you pay the capital, buy the vans and so on. Mm. And we had Jhunjhunwala's support. Mm. So it became like a private public participation. And we began to scale. So we were suddenly doing new things that had never been attempted, at least not at scale, before in India, perhaps even in the world. And then uh, through Rakesh's support, we got money to start building a few centers on the land. And then I met an ecologist who said he will come and transform the ecology of the land for no cost, a man called Yellapa Reddy. And so that began to take off. Of course, that took a lot of time. A uh, tree takes a long time to, to grow. But so today we have a sort of ecological preserve on campus with lots of unique, almost extinct species of herbs and so on, conceptual gardens. We have some 15 odd hands-on experiential science centers. A few of them were inaugurated by Dr. Abdul Kalam, who was a great friend of Agastya. And of course, these mobile labs have spread across the country and they led to labs on motorbikes and various other things. So today in the COVID context, last year, you think you've arrived and you've done a lot. And then suddenly you get a massive slap. And COVID did that to us. And I remember there was a lot of doom and gloom in the organization. We were, you know, about 12, 1400 people. How are we going to maintain the, the wage bill and all the rest of it? Because we were hearing that corporate CSR was shrinking because of COVID. So we've always had this attitude in Augustia, and I hope we continue to have it, which is always see a problem as an opportunity. There is always an opportunity. You might find it or you might not, but it exists. Okay, And this is the way they are grouped over the last 20 years. Barren wasteland, opportunity to transform it, it happened. No money for buildings, yeah. mobile lab. Science fairs, we didn't have teachers to train students. We were desperate. Bunch of students came and said, why don't you train us? We will teach our fellow students. And that led to peer learning. So every time there was a crisis or a problem we found, Either we found the opportunity or the opportunity was brought to our notice by somebody else and we were open enough to grasp it and seize it. So with this track record, I told the organization, what is the opportunity here? We all know what the problem is. And so then I said, maybe the opportunity is if we pivot big time to online digital, but with a difference we find a way of combining online digital with our strength and hands-on physical learning. The opportunity is to create a blended learning model at scale that no one has done in the world before, at least not for underprivileged children and government school teachers. So we said, that's the big opportunity. And we are on that path. And if that we start with ActiLearn, yeah, so one of the things with ActiLearn was, so this is ActiLearn. It's a fascinating book. See, I'm told there are about 60 million children between grade six and eight. And of that about 70% at least do not have access to online digital. So it's at least 40, maybe 45 million children. So we said, what do we do for these kids who don't have online digital? Neither do they have access to physical, the mobile labs and science centers and their schools or digital. So we came up with this book called ActiLearn. And what it is, while it's a physical book, 
it includes a lot of activities, okay? And most of these activities involve making things out of paper. And they're very integrated. They're built around four or five science themes. And there is a bit of art. There's a lot of making, so psychomotor skills. There's a lot of questioning, so curiosity, creativity. It builds your confidence. It allows you to collaborate with your friends. So each book actually, once one person uses it, they can pass it on to as many children as they like. So for 60 rupees, Theoretically, a hundred children could use it, or maybe three or four or five. If it were just five children, it's 12 rupees a child. If it's 10 children, it's six rupees a child, right? So what we said is these 40 odd million children, can we send ActiLearn to them? And it's very powerful the way it's been designed. You cut out things, you make things very powerful. And we said, let this be the first of a series. It's, this may be the way. We have come up with a new vision called Agastya 2.0. See, till now, the number is we have reached about 16, 17 million children in the last 21 years, 22 years. Now we have said in the next five to seven years, we must reach 100 million children. Mm -hmm. Now, through mobile labs and labs on motorbikes, that's going to be almost impossible. So teacher training is very important, we do that. And we said ActiLearn is so inexpensive. It could be the silver bullet that could reach 30, 40, 50 million children at a very low cost. So that's what ActiLearn is. And, and the instructions in this book, they are more symbolic or they are in English? So we use the English one for people who want it in English, typically they tend to be donors, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whether in India or abroad. But we operate in the student's local language, wherever we go. Okay. So ActiLearn will be available in Hindi to cover the entire Hindi belt, Telugu, Kannada, Tamil, Marathi, Gujarati. I think these are the six languages, maybe Bengali we will do soon. Six or seven languages we will initially focus on. So ActiLearn is a development which happened after the onset of COVID. Exactly. And the way it happened was a conversation where I was asking one of our guys, how well is our online digital thing working? And one of the things we did with online digital, we taught children how to use their home as a laboratory, the kitchen, anything at home. So he said, it's working brilliantly, blended learning. I said, what would make it work even better? He said, if we could send the children some small materials like a magnet, a pair of scissors, magnifying glass, et cetera. So I said, okay, come up with what we call a home lab kit. And he came up with a home lab kit that costs 450 rupees. And we've distributed about a few thousand of them across India. They're very nice. And then I said, look, Manju, 450 is still too much. For, for super scaling. Can you do something below 100 rupees? He said, physically with magnets, etc., not possible. So then he said, but maybe the manual. But I said, the manual lacks the physical stuff. And physical is very important, making and doing. So then we brainstormed and he said, we can get them to do it out of paper. So we will do a manual from which you can cut out things and make things. And so we brainstormed some more and we came up with ActiLearn. So th this is the beauty of the process of innovation that Agastya believes in, which is keep asking questions. How is this working? Can it be done differently? What would you do? We hit this brick wall. So what's the way around it? And can we reduce the cost by a fifth? And all that. And I find this, the beauty about the other day, somebody asked me, you quit your job and banking, you came back now, it's 20, 21 years. Do you have any regrets? I said, you can't have regrets because that's a stupid thing. Whether I did something great or not, there's no point in having a regret. It is what it is. Having said that, I have no regrets. 
because this has been so stimulating an experience. My father, I remember telling me, you're doing this, remember he and Dr. Ayenga told me, you realize there's no money in this? I said, yes. So my father said, as long as you realize that and you're willing to live with that, fine. Five, 10 years from now, don't say who was my colleague at Citibank is now worth a hundred million dollars or a billion, because then you're going to be miserable. I said, I can't guarantee I won't feel that way, but my sense is I won't. So he said, okay, you're a 42 year old guy. You should know what you're doing. I can only help you think through it. And you've decided to do it. I will support you in any way I can go for it. So one of the reasons I don't have any regrets, the main reason is just the experience, the emotional connect with the children, doing things with a sense of freedom, meeting a lot of people, is intellectually it's been tremendously stimulating to try and solve apparently unsolvable problems. When so many good things start coming together and you wouldn't know that they will come together. Correct. What do you call that process? The thing is, the nature of uncertainty you can't predict. All you can do is put in the best effort you can, emotionally and intellectually. Get ideas from people, because you can't be the fount of everything. So when all that happens, there is a good chance that things will gel. Now, they might gel in ways that you did not expect. We never expected, me and my colleagues, that we would become the largest mobile science lab operators in the world. That was not part of the original vision, right? So you have to have an open mind, be willing to go with the flow, not be stuck on a straight line way of thinking. Life is oblique, zigzag. It's not straight. So I had to let go of all that. When you let go of all that, there is a lot less stress. There is more uncertainty because you're accepting uncertainty. But when you let go of the need to go in a straight line, there's more excitement, there's more adventure, there's more uncertainty. And you have an objective, but you have to realize that what is a great goal today, tomorrow may or may not be relevant. So don't get too hung up on your goals. Enjoy the process. There's this story. I think it's a Taoist story of this farmer. And he has a, a son and a horse. And they're very poor and they're farming and the horse is essential for plowing the land. And uh, one day <clears throat> there is a war in the region. And actually before that, what happens is one day this horse before the war, runs away into the forest. So then they say, oh, all his friends who are so happy, he had, this guy has lost his horse. Say, oh, you poor guy. And then the horse comes back with three or four horses. And then the friends say, oh, you're so lucky. And he says, maybe. And then one day his son falls down from the horse. He loves riding horses and breaks his leg. And all his friends come and say, oh, you poor guy. Now your son is... And he says, yeah, maybe that there's a war that's declared in the region and they go looking for young, able-bodied boys. And all his friend's sons have to go into the war except his son who's lying in bed with a broken leg. And all the farmers come and say, damn it, you're so lucky. And this guy says, maybe at any one point in time, what you think is bad fortune or good fortune is very relative, maybe. What happens is what's interesting, what's next. So Agastya is living through that and this has helped us view things in a certain perspective, which is don't get too carried away one way or the other. I think what you've started the conversation with is this division which happens. And exactly this making conclusions very fast divides up everything. It doesn't let one see the larger picture. Correct, you're very right. What are some of the most uh, surprising or maybe shocking things which have happened in this uh, journey for you? 
you never expected such outcomes of positivity or such outcomes on the other side. Maybe. On the other side, obviously, COVID has been a shock for the whole world. <coughs> so equally, it's been a shock to, to, to me and to a lot of my colleagues. The shocking thing was, I thought, as I said, if I get the land, I've solved the problem. I got the land and what I thought was a great boon turned out to be an albatross around my neck because people were calling me from the government after the land was given, saying, where are the buildings? And there were all kinds of gossip. Is this project for real or what? Even Dr. Ayenga, who was a great friend, one day told me, five years have gone by and I haven't even seen a brochure. So what I'm hearing that Agastya doesn't have money, so what's going on? And he had lent his name to the foundation. And I gave him a CD showing a science fair. And he looked at that CD and he said, wow, forget about the brochure. Okay, so the land initially was a huge coup. It became an albatross around my neck. Today it has become the crown jewel of Augusta, right? Like the farmer and his horse and his son. Uh, hopefully it stays the crown jewel. <laughs> it's riding the waves undulating up and down and our philosophy in India says I think the word is Leela so we need to embrace this thing like we saw the test match and we see these one days since cricket is so important in India and using that example but life is a series of waves and uh, what makes a wave good or bad just depends on your perspective we get hung up on perspectives. I get hung up on a perspective. Then if you get hung up on that's division, this is good and that's bad. So then suddenly life appears either thrilling or it appears depressed. But somebody with a different perspective might find your depression to be thrilling yeah. and your thrill to be depressed. That in the cricket games, England waving their flags, India waving their flags, that becomes the model for life and it's based on division. So one needs to look into one's own psyche and see how one is thinking about things. And attachment to the results. We get too attached. That's the problem. The matter of going inside oneself is of course said very easily, rarely happens and happens with very rare people. But I think that is the result of developing a certain even-mindedness in life. I think so. The even-mindedness probably happens if you question and reflect more. A lot of us don't do it, either because we are not trained to do it, and this happens at home, how many parents tell their children, look, you did very well in something great. Why don't you think about what it meant to do very well and how you feel about it? And when you do very badly, spend some time thinking about it, talking about it. Where is that feeling coming from? So if we are not trained from a young age to do that, which is a pity because that is the Indian tradition, but yes. a lot of us are not trained today. Yes. Then when we encounter a storm, we don't have the capacity to deal with it. Either success or failure. Success goes to our head and failure might depress us. So that equanimity that you talked about, the even-handed way of thinking is not there because we haven't been trained. And I would say that is the most important thing in education. Even today, after a lot of information available on how really parents in schools are not doing things in the right way, examples like yourself available that things can be done in different manner. Why there is still an obsession with making obedient children and making children only relate to marks, grades, numbers. Why are we not able to get out of this? I think there are two reasons. One is we are very self-centered. 
when we talk about I love my child, I love my child provided the child does A, B, C. Mm. Okay. Mm. My child has got 99% uh, got into IIT and made it to Harvard. Mm. It fills me with pride. In other words, you're constantly looking at your own nearest and dearest, but actually your love is highly conditioned by your own insecurities, by your own aspirations. Okay, that is one element. The second element is what Krishnamurti beautifully, I watched an old talk of his at Rishi Valley, and he's looking at these students and saying, this, that, and one boy says, but if I did that, what you're saying, what will people say? And he says, George Bernard Shaw used to have a saying on his mantelpiece, and Bernard Shaw called Krishnamurti the most beautiful human being on earth when, when they met. He said, Bernard Shaw had a thing on his mantelpiece that said, people say, let them say. So Krishnamurti looks at the boy and says, why do you care what people say? And then he says, learn to stand alone. Do you know what it means to stand alone? And there's quietness in the room and he says, you don't have the guts. I'm thinking about this. What does it mean psychologically to stand alone? It means I can't be a conditioned human being. So if you say, it is right to go and curse somebody else and wave a flag and thrust it down their throat. I'm not going to do it. If you say getting marks is the most important thing, and because the media says this is the most important thing, IIT getting in and building up all these people. Hey, I'm going to have an independent view and say, if I believe through my own thinking, this is not of essential value. I'm not going to tell my child or even myself follow that path. So more parents, more human beings need to learn to think and act independently. We are like sheep. We read about, I'm not saying Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos are good or bad people. It has nothing to do with it. You read about all these people, whether it's Silicon Valley, entrepreneur, and this and that, they're all made into heroes then many of them are brought down. And then we all go, wow, that's the way I want my son to be or daughter to be, or they're villains. Where is the independent thinking? Because if you keep your children down, they can never be independent. You yourself were kept down. A lot of parents ask me often, how can I spark curiosity in my child? And I say, when they come back from school, have you ever asked them the question, what questions did you ask in class today? Lovely. And usually the parent looks at me sheepishly. Huh? Then how can you spark curiosity? Yeah? It becomes like Kabir's Pani. It's purely an intellectual idea because you're not curious to find out what questions your children ask. You should be curious. Sometimes these words are so leading in their own way independent is being internally dependent so being dependent on yourself any experiences with bhagavad gita so obviously i i've read parts of it at one time i memorized a lot of uh, shlokas from there when i was living in london i still have the bhagavad gita that my grandfather gave my father when he went to england in the 19 i guess 40s and what can I say? It's Krishna was, the character of Krishna was, it's, it's unbelievable. No, you know? I, yeah, no, I brought it up because you started saying that there is a lot of selfishness in our love. And, and Gita is all about being unselfish. And, and Gita is also a great psychological philosophy, which, is, which you spoke about being independent, going inside yourself. So I just thought of asking you this question then. Yeah. So what happens? You know, I don't want to sound preachy. I include myself in the group. There's a big gap between what we read and how we live. Yeah. That is the issue. 
There is a lot of hypocrisy and we are part of that group. You're right. Fantastic, fantastic speaking to you, Ramji, sir. Not uh, at all. Lovely this, speaking to you. This conversation, with your permission, is only going to be part one of our series because I have got a lot many things which are unanswered yet. And I would love to pick your brains on that. We would love to learn more about Agastya, more about some of the real things which have happened over there, how it has impacted children and what transformations really have happened on the ground. So I would reach out to you to seek your time one more time. And probably we do that at your campus. Wonderful. I look forward to that. It'd be yeah. a much lo lovelier setting for that, Harsh. Absolutely, absolutely. I look forward. I will make that to happen. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Sir. Wishing you to take Augustia to become what no other institution has become, to, to lay the seeds of unselfishness in every child, of independence in every child, and from Augustia may it spread all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank sir. you so much. Thank you for your good wishes. Thank you. Bye. Sir.